much. Thank you very much. So, um, I'm going to stand up so I can see all of you. And I'm told if I speak loudly, I'll be audible on the on the thing. So the microphone. And Colin's back there with a thumbs up. I can also do things in stereo. I can kind of find things back and forth with this. Um, there's this, excuse uh, me, we have the world right up here um, as a screensaver. Uh, the, the title is The Giant Zero, which is a, a provocative one. It sounds a little bit negative, but, um, uh, but it's a way of kind of summing up uh, a bunch of different things that I've been thinking about over the years. This is old joke that, you know, give me a minute and tell me everything you know. I'm going to give you like an hour and tell you. Uh, a lot of what I've picked up by studying the open source world and a number of other uh, subjects over the last over the last few years. So, with that, we have, we have a lot of metaphors for the net already, and I, I study those. And I'm wondering why we would want one more with this giant zero idea that I'm going to float at you. Today. And and I think it's because it helps us understand the best one, the best metaphor that is better. And I'll tell you what that is in a little bit. And also why the worst ones are giving us huge problems. Um, uh, we've sort of, I think, suffered a little bit of a defeat around net neutrality. I think a lot of us feel that way. Um, and I'd like to explore that and why uh, some other things have come along. So, for example, as we know, <clears throat> as uh, Senator Ted Stevens himself told us, the Internet is not just something you dump something on. It's not a big truck. It's a series of tubes. And then, as Rick Felton came along and said, it is right, as a matter of fact. Experts talk about pipes all the time. Is the gap between tubes and pipes really so large? So. And it, is, it isn't when you reduce everything to content. Now, this funny thing happened. I'm sure it happened to Dan and others among us who were journalists. A few years ago, we were writers, and then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, we found out we were content providers, you know, like our, like our words got, you know, strapped into a large package and sold at Costco. Like they had, like, a finite quantity that could be shoved in a tube and shoved down or put on a truck or whatever. You could make this fine distinction between pipes and tubes and so forth, but you're still talking about content. I think it's a... It's a problem. So, for example, if you take a subject, you, it's not too oxymoronic to do a search for FCC and decency at the same time, I would hope. Uh, by the way, my, my identity, we'll talk about identity later, on, on Google Gmail is anitadrink at gmail.com. And, and that's because I eliminated my own identity by incompetently registering myself four or five times in a row, eliminating old Searles and Searles and Doc Searles. And so I finally gave up and went with that. So if you look up... FCC and decency, um, you get this. You get this page. And if you look at the URL, you find it's, it's you know, uh, at the bottom back end of it, the file is called content.html. This, this little JPEG is called content.jpeg. And, uh, you know, that's very tough. But a certain kind of content called obscenity and decency and profanity, which is against the law. And it's not only against the law, they tell you, they go around and say it's not protected by the First Amendment. Well, you know, well, that raises the question, why, why wouldn't it be? You know, so if, and how can you reconcile the First Amendment with the FCC? Because um, you've got the First Amendment here, and you've got, you know, content.jpg over here. Um, <laughs> is what it is. And so, and you've got the law, you know, Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech or of the press. Then how can Congress make laws abridging the freedom of speech in broadcasts? Well, the way you can is by... Uh, defining broadcasting as transporting content and not as speech, and doing it for like over seven years. So here we've got giant tubes, and on the other hand, we have you know something I found in that a free speech area has been set aside, some small place to do your free speech. But the difference isn't trivial; it's actually critical. It's actually critical to the way we think. Um, broadcasting moves content through the stuff we call media. Media is a medium; it's kind of a through sort of thing. Meanwhile, speech happens in a place, and there's a difference between those two. And as we see from the FCC, content is not protected, and nor are non-press media, while the press is still safe, for now, because at least that part is in the First Amendment of the Constitution. They're covered. Um, but what about the press on the net? Um, well, it kind of depends, aren't you? But it doesn't. It depends on whether or not you're shipping something, or whether or not you're speaking. So... <clears throat> You know, fortunately, so far, the net is not just a truck or a series of tubes. In fact, we commonly use at least four metaphors when we think of talking about the net. Um, when we talk about content that's going through a medium or transported um, with a protocol, for example, it's about shipping. And if, it's, if we architect or design or construct something, we build sites with addresses that get traffic and so forth, um, it's about real estate. And if we write or we author something called pages uh, that we browse, it's about writing and... If we perform for an audience that has an experience 
it's about theater. Of course, we can mix these things up. You're talking about delivering an experience, for example, and kind of mix shipping and theater at the same time with those. But all these things are going on in our heads at once, and all of them give rise to different regulatory regimes. They give rise to different assumptions. We have, they allow us to talk completely past each other. So, so that's how we mix our metaphors. So, for example, this is a new thing that Dave Weiner uh, came up with. It's actually been around for a little bit, but he gave us a wonderful metaphor for it. Dave, by the way, is, is, deserves credit for a whole big pile of things, but one of them is this thing, idea called River of News, which is where you simply take a, a, a web page and you pour it into a form that looks good on a handheld device. Like this is a, a Nokia 770 uh, handheld uh, Linux um, uh, computer, and this is this is my uh, Trio uh, 700, which I just I just by the way I just stopped paying for this 20, 30 bucks a month <laughs> to Verizon to be able to look at the web on your on your thing or. 10 cents a, a, a kilobyte or something. Talk about tubes and trucking and the rest of it. That's what they are. So, but River Views is this, is this metaphor for feeds to mobile devices, for example, and they combine transport, publishing, and even agricultural metaphors in that with fees. So, which is best? Which is best? Uh, which is best for us to have in there uh, the net itself and for us who comprise it? So that's that's a question I've thought about a lot. Uh, before we go there, I want to dig deeper into the metaphor thing, because I think there is a way of combining these metaphors that allow us to win a few more of these net neutrality type arguments in government, also make sense to each other as well as we try to build the net out. So here's cognitive linguistics uh, 101 in one slide. Um, uh, so it goes like this. Meta metaphors are actually the real matrix. How many people here saw the matrix? Have you all, all seen it? You know, yeah, most of them have. Yeah. I have to go see it. It's my favorite movie of all time. Fabulous movie. It's a great metaphor movie. And that's George Lakoff, who's a, a professor of uh, a kind of linguistics and cognitive science at Berkeley. He's a, a friend and a mentor of mine. And, um, and what he teaches is that we, in fact, think and talk in terms of other subjects. In other words, we borrow whole vocabularies for everything we're talking about all the time, whether we like it or not. And those subjects are like what we talk about, but they're not the same thing as what we're talking about, meaning that this equals that because this is not that. It's like that, but it's not exactly that. And this is all unconscious, and um, it also has an irony behind all understanding, but not necessarily beyond it. So let's unpack that. So every metaphor is a box of borrowed words. So we call that a concept. It's a conceptual metaphor. So, And we use these concepts to frame our understanding of everything. So, for example, time and life. Okay, so we talk about time using a completely different thing that's not time. Anybody want to give me a quick guess what that is? See how unconscious it is? <laughs> we got a, a smart people together. Well, what is it? Space. Space? No? Sparkle. Yeah, it's a bunch of things. It's actually, it's actually money. <laughs> you know, we say we waste it, we save it, we spend it, we throw it away, we put it aside, you know, we invest it. All the, we borrow the language of money when we talk about time. We do it completely unconsciously. For life, what would it be? Hell, amazing. It's travel. When we say birth is arrival or death is departure, choices are crossroads, careers are paths, we fall off the wagon, we get stuck in a rut, we move in the fast lane, we cut them off at the pass, we get lost in the woods. It goes on. You cannot begin to talk about life without borrowing the language of travel. It can't be done. It can't be done. All the endless poetry has been written about this, with this, without anybody ever, ever examining it. We can't help doing that. So if we get to politics, and this is George has become a great hero of the Democratic Party. He called, wrote a book called Why Think of an Elephant, and back in, in 1995 he had a really terrific book, uh, which I think is his best book, um, called Moral Politics, What Conservatives Know That Liberals Don't. The, the second edition of it was How Liberals and Conservatives Think, but I really like the first title better. He says we can all frame politics in terms of the nation as a family. So here's George, and here's the nation, and here's a perfect family from 1952, namely mine. That's me right there, uh, sitting with my father, fresh back from World War II. There was this whole, the 50s was really great. Everybody, everybody's parents had exactly the same experience. It was really wonderful. That's why we idealized the 50s, I think, to some extent. Anyway, he came to the conclusion, that conclusion, that he framed things as the nation's family. After he heard this, he heard, why should the best people be punished and you heard that from this guy, Dan Quayle, who was a, a former vice president of the U.S. and a great golfer and not a deep thinker. Um, but anyway, that's what Dan said to the Republican National Committee in 1992. 
and he was talking about graduated tra taxation, where the rich people pay more than the poor people do, and, um, and that's been part of the tax code since uh, forever. Um, but he doesn't like that, and a lot of conservatives don't like that. And it was an applause line, and he got a lot of, everybody was clapping, and George was appalled. He said, he said wait a minute, I, why are the best people, you know, w w what is it about this? You know, w why are the best people the richest? Why is taxation punishment? And, and where did the vocabulary get borrowed from in order to, to make sense of this? Um, and, he, and he realized, wait a minute, I'm a cognitive linguist, and even though I'm kind of a Berkeley liberal guy, I ought to figure out what this is, because these people are talking sense to each other, and I'm not getting it. So he discovered this. He said, the conservative box of words actually has a consistent set of family ideals, and, and those are these. When they talk, it's all the whole Boy Scout Oak is in here. You have character and virtue and discipline and toughness and thrift and competition, hard work, property is important, you get rewarded, you know, you, get, you, you punish the evildoers, you know, you bring them to justice, right? Um, and common sense, very conservatives love to talk about common sense. The liberals have a different box, have the same box, but it's a fam different family box, and they'll talk about fairness and compassion and empathy and mercy, renewable energy, alternatives, fulfillment, <laughs> happiness. They'll talk about justice too, but they mean something a little bit different by that. Uh, Self-respect, caring, that's the liberal box of words. And, and for both of them, those two boxes are kind of like, which you show both at the same time, they're kind of like chalkboards on the, figures on the chalkboards of each other's minds, you know. And, the, and, and so, so naturally, you talk about neutrality, oh, everything's evil, equal, and let's, let's have neutrality. That does not necessarily play with your conservatives, which I, is one reason I think net neutrality was an unfortunate choice of word. So they think in terms of different idealized families. So here's your conservative ideal. You've got John Wayne, right? you know? Well, Pilgrim, what do you want to do? So, and uh, and I, I took this from some, you know, some place on the web, who knows, from private and copyright. Anyway, that's this, what he calls the strict father model. The strict father model is an idealized family headed by a strict father. Um, who teaches a certain way, and so they come down like this. So the, the, the idea behind here is, behind the conservative worldview, is you start from the realization that the world's a dangerous place, and also competitive, and you need a strong, protective, morally strong leader who stands up to evil um, and has these virtues that you teach to your children, you know, which are strength, obedience, loyalty, respect, self-discipline, deferral of goals, uh, the goodness of wealth, Freedom, that's, uh, that's in both of the systems. And, and the liberals, on the other hand, will come from the idea of the world is a good place. And, and that children are born good and they need to be made better. Um, original sin is not necessarily part of the liberal uh, uh, worldview. Highest values are empathy and caring and responsibility, community. That freedom's in there, too. But a point that George makes is that, in fact, a lot of the same words are in both value systems. They're just ordered differently. They're different. They're prioritized in a much different way because they come from a different idealized view of the world. So, now here's my point. I, I don't want. To, I just wanted to use that as an example because we're going to really be talking about the net and not necessarily about politics. So that does that does play, and I think we can learn something from the net neutrality example. But conservative political rhetoric has one really big advantage, which is that a dangerous world is more interesting than a nice one. <laughs> Okay, children may be born good, but your bad children make much better literature. <laughs> so, um, and it's a lot simpler too. And you know, it's an excuse to employ. This is the most important thing, the most powerful metaphor of all, which is, of course, war. As uh, George S. Patton said, compared to war, all other forms of human endeavor are shrink in significance. That's what uh, George C. Scott put it, at least in the, in the movie. <laughs> God help me, I do love it though. So. He knew what he was talking about. So no box of words is more handy than the war box. And as, as, as Dan knows, or any jur journalist knows, you've got this box of words that are all about war. You can bring them into anything. They're really handy. You know, you, you bring them into sports. You can bring them into politics. You can bring them into sociology. It doesn't matter what it is. You know, you talk about conflict and defeating those guys. The war on poverty. The war on drugs. The war on whatever it is. Terrorism, of course. You know, it's a terrible thing. The world's a dangerous place. War on terrorism makes complete sense to a lot of people. So, switch out of politics. So let's go back to the net again. So now that I've explained linguistics a little bit, you know, which metaphor do we want if we're going to try and emphasize one over the other or two over the other? And I think it's these two. I think that it's, it's real estate. It's the sense that the net is a place, and at the same time that it's a place that supports a lot of things, including speech. So speech happens in a place. So it happens to be real estate. 
So it's a place for free speech through writing in hopefully equally protected forms. And there's nothing wrong, of course, with the other metaphors. We're going to be using them anyway, but we can't, we can't help doing that. But we need to stand on and for the net as a place where free speech happens. And because we need to get the conservative majority that's in Congress as a place where free enterprise happens as well. That's something we've never emphasized very well in the future, which together appeal, I think, to both political framing systems. So, about speech and content. I think speech informs, and it's not just about delivering content. So we go back to Dan, or we go to George. And, and the difference between informing and delivering content is critical, because information, we talk about information as if it's a commodity. You know, I'm going to deliver information to you. You know, I want some information from you. You know, books are filled with information as if it's a, a solid thing, yet it's derived from this verb to inform, which is derived from turn from the verb to form, which means that we actually form each other. So, I mean, if, 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 uh, if, if Colin tells me something I didn't hear before and I didn't know before that's interesting to me, I'm changed by that. I can't now suddenly say, I'm not going to wipe that out of my mind. Oh, I have that information, I'm going to put it away now. I don't have that information anymore. No, I'm changed by it. We are all constantly changed by each other. We're formed by each other, which means that, in fact, in other words, we are all authors of each other. And that's what authority does. That's where authority comes from. So it's no mistake that, that when you go to, if you, when, when Google in the first place talked about how page rank worked, they took uh, inbound links, or the number of inbound links, and the, tr and the incoming tree of links to links to links as a form of authority, like votes for authority. And Tegnorati did the same thing. Um, I was involved in Tegnorati, still am involved in Tegnorati to some degree. Um, and I'm on their advisory board, I'm good friends with them there. And, and they wanted to know, what, is there another word other than authority they could use to, to measure how well people come out, you know, how well the results are sorted when you start narrowing it down, because that's one of the things, things that they do in theirs. So, and this is something I just I searched for Dan here, because I wrote about Dan this morning. Um, Dan Brickland right over here. So, and here it is. I mean, Te Tegnorati actually indexes that stuff pretty fast. So, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Anyway, authority, I think, is a right that we give certain others to form and shape what we know. Uh, so we don't just find the best information, we find what's best qualified to form or author what we know. So we are all generative. This is a, a word that um, I got from Jonathan Zittrain, who's not here, but maybe, Jonathan, you're watching right now. Um, he was just in Second Life just a minute he was, ago. He was just in Second Life a minute ago? Tell him we miss him in the first one. Um, anyway, so this is, this is the abstract for, uh, for his piece that, uh, uh, that he wrote recently. I think it was just uh, last year, and it's still in, in the works. But it's interesting to look at the, to look at the metaphors used here. You know, we have, we have distribute here, code and content. Uh, we have audiences. We have consumers. Um, we have markets. And uh, we have this word decisive that's a little bit, that's probably as close as the lawyer part of them. We get to using the war metaphor. We want to decisive. Victory, I suppose. Um, so let's look at how the net is changing the generativity of the commodity we call information. Um, and one way is that the media are no longer uh, the only media. There's a missing half a quote there. So it started with TiVo in a way. We had some control over what we got there. And now suddenly the TV is turned into the iPod. And, and everybody seems to be podcasting, NPR and, and so forth. YouTube is huge. Um, this is a, uh, uh, this Minotaur launch is just a, this is a video I shot with my nine-year-old kid last year from a launch from Vandenberg near where I live in Santa Barbara. It's got piles of, 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 of uh, comments on it now. It's been viewed a couple thousand times. Some of the comments are in Japanese. I never even meant to make that like a TV show, but it sort of is one. Um, the point is that the big trend isn't more content, it's consumers becoming producers. That's that's what's happening now. So, for example, in photography, um, I mean, all of us here, I suppose, are digital photographers at this point, right? I mean, not many of us are still working in film. Um, if you're shooting digital photographs, you're really not consumers anymore. You're producers. We're all producers. Um, pr enabling production by everybody is changing whole industries from places where one big producer or a few big producers that comprise silos are doing things to where everybody is participating in some way. So, so for example, you know, before you used to buy film, take it to Costco, you got back your prints, 
he showed them in albums or, or drawers or some other place and they disappeared. Um, now we put them up on Flickr or in a place like Flickr. And so here's this piece that was in Newsweek a while ago of, uh, of, uh, of, of Katerina and, and, and Stuart. And basically, they came up with this really cool way to put photos on the web and and as a result, people like me never cross Kodak anymore. Kodak is not part of my life. And Kodak is one of the largest patent holders in the history of the world. Yet these guys had an end run around them that enabled everybody rather than just, just one big company. So what's happening is that openness and cooperation are turning photography into this truly free marketplace. It isn't just Fuji and Sony and Nikon anymore. Um, it's everybody. So. I've got right now. I've got uh, let's see, eleven thousand three hundred twenty-six pictures on Flickr, including these that I shot of a fire that was near Santa Barbara uh, uh, when I was flying out yesterday morning. And they also show up over here. Um, this is a company called Tableau, and I don't see Antonio Rodriguez here. Uh, he was going to try and make it. Antonio is a friend. He lives here in town, um, and he came up with this company called Tableau. And because Flickr has a pile of open APIs, and because they treat my data as my data and not their data, they make it possible, they, they just open it up. They say, anybody else, any any other company wants to come in and take all of that stuff, all of those photographs, and we'll call it content, you know, take all my photographs, all that data, and move it over to their thing so I can work on it over there, you can do that. And so, in fact, and so here's the same thing. This is a, the latest Tableau I did this morning where I just took Tableau is where it, Tableau does a bunch of stuff that Flickr doesn't. So Flickr understands they can't do everything in the marketplace. And so does Tableau. And so we have a bigger marketplace for photography because there's this openness that's going on between these different companies. So they both see the pictures as, as my data and not theirs. So they, don't, they see the market as more than your choice of silo. So here's another, as a case in point here, too. This is La Conchita. La Conchita is a town on the coast of California that that's below a mountain that's rising faster than most volcanoes. Oh, because it's not a volcano, people don't pay close attention to that. And so there were a series of landslides last year that actually killed some people right here. And I'm kind of into geology, and I wanted to get a good picture of that when I was coming into Santa Barbara one day. And so I took this one, and somebody came along and said, hey, I'll give you $200 for that picture. And they did, and it paid for four years or more of, of, of Flickr. So, and there's, right now, I think I've sold about $400 worth of pictures on Flickr without even trying. So that I'm trying to be a professional photographer here, but even without even intending to, that's what's happening. And the same thing's happening in video. Here's Rocket Boom. It's an older picture with has a, has Amanda on it. But at that time, this in July, when I lasted this slide, um, there were more than 300,000 downloads a day, and CNN at the same time had a fraction of that in downloads. And the difference in cost were, you know, from a few hundred dollars a show to advertising on eBay for, you know, forty dollars a week. That's what they—that's their cost of, of uh, for forty k per week. They're selling advertising for forty k per week on eBay, and the cost of producing a show is trivial compared to what the cost of producing uh, CNN is. So this is a question I asked last winter that was pretty interesting. I go to CES, the Consumer Electronics Show, every winter. And I like to ask questions of the guys that make the big stuff that the rest of us can't make and what that's going to do in the world. And uh, that's one of the pictures I took coming out of, out of Santa Barbara, too. One of the things I found is the price of a 1080p screen will be under $1,000 at Costco by the end of 2007. It may already be there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is already there? Okay. And a 1080p, is, is that, that's the top level of the old, the old high definition used to be like this really advanced thing. Well, the FCC's rules went as far as 1080p. That's the most we can imagine them. Like 1996. Well, that's we're, we're there now. Okay, and under a thousand dollars at Costco, the price of a 1080p camcorder will be under two thousand. A lot of the recent Star Wars movie were shot on 1080p video cameras, kind of almost secretly. They wanted to see if people could sell it. Wasn't film. They couldn't. That was a 1080p camera that cost like forty thousand dollars. That camera now is about five. It's coming down. And the price of computing projection here will be under. Uh, 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 production rather, you're only under three thousand dollars. So, so any number of us can now suddenly be the people who make whatever. The capacity for producing movies is getting within the reach of almost anybody. So, so the question here though is what what happens to the distribution system for this stuff, right? Because the capacity isn't there to move that stuff around right now. Cable systems aren't going to do it. 
And the carriers on top of that don't want you to produce and distribute video. This is this is from my house. I mean, we've actually cranked it up now to we're over, you know, over five megabits in one direction, but we're only 742 on the other side. And by the way, in order to get this, I had to pay for 10, but they have a provision to get. 10 on the downside, but they have a provision to get. In order to get a meg on the upside, and they have a provision either in Santa Barbara, because we're kind of at the back of their of their list, of their of the places they're going to build out. In any case, they're built for asymmetry, from a few producers to a million consumers, and they still cripple the upstream service, even though the demand for upstream is going up. Um, I talked to a, a, one of the local, the, the guy who runs the um, public affairs office for a local cable company in Santa Barbara. We had this big meeting. There's a room filled with about as many people as are here. Many of them Hollywood producers that didn't that wanted fiber level uh, connectivity, so they didn't have to go down to Century City or to Burbank in order to produce um, computer generated animation and other kind of back end stuff on uh, with the giant Linux servers they have down there. They wanted to be able to do this over uh, online. But they're willing to pay for it. And and this guy told me, look, people just want to consume TV. The internet is basically gravy. On, I didn't use this word, but it's basically basically gravy on their on the TV service. They monitor use, and nobody's really using upstream. And I said, how can you tell if you're not providing it? And that was lost on. They're built for television. So, and they're saying this could choke the net rather than choke them. This is a this is a piece really planted at the Associated Press. I mean, uh, um, it, it's pretty much been tagged from the from the from the uh, cable or telephone industry. They see the net as another TV channel. It's just one-way content. That's the way they, they see things. And the problem was and still is that they don't like or respect the net and that they're in the business to create and maintain billable events, which is a term I owe to Bob. Um, and I think it's, it's true. I mean, Verizon actually wants to charge me for every single uh, picture I move from my camera to another camera. I'm just moving a file. But, you know, it's as if they had a, had a you know, a meter on your hard drive. It makes no sense whatsoever. But if they can do it, they will. So there's nothing wrong with it as long as it doesn't compromise the net itself. But we have a problem if it isn't clear to what most of us what the net is. So it's kind of interesting. If we think of the net as a utility, among other utilities, and that's what a lot of the municipalities are calling it now. They're calling it the fifth utility. And perhaps there's a pile of others that could qualify for the other four. Electrical, roads, sewage, waste treatment, water, the rest of them thinking of it as yet another utility. But you can explain, any, any citizen can explain what the water system is or what the electrical system is. So most people, the net is still an extra bill you get along with the tele telephone or you get along with the cable, and that's, that's a problem. You ask people, what is the net? You're going to get an answer like you got from, from, from Senator Stevens. You know? Well, it's just this thing I, I have, right? It's not, it's not clear. So that's where, that's where we get to the jump zero. And so this is where, and I want to try this out on you guys, because I thought of this the other day, and I thought, well, what better place to talk about it from here? Craig Burton, who's an old friend of mine, Craig was responsible, I think, more than anybody else for the success of Novell in the 80s, and he did this by reconceiving what, the, what, the, what a network was. Um, if you went back to, you know, took the Wayback Machine to, say, about 1980, there were magazines about this thing called Data Communications, and, uh, I don't know, Communications Week and I think Network World wasn't even around it. All of them were talking about OmniNet versus JetNet versus Corvus. There were all 50 different kinds of Ethernet. All of them required their own cabling and so forth. And Craig came along to Novell and said, well, why don't we just think of the net, or a network, rather, as a set of services? So you need file and you need print. So we'll just give you file and print. And he kind of blew up the, the entire conversation that had been going on around network. It changed the game completely. It was pretty neat to watch. And and Craig, by the way, says, what is the Ethernet business today, by the way? <laughs> Ethernet business is approximately zero, which is a little tiny feature. I was trying to protect it. So he compares the net to a hollow sphere. There's Craig, and there's the best thing to do with a hollow sphere. And he says, if you've got an architecture that's all ends, which is what David Reed and the other guys wrote in the end-to-end uh, -end, end -end architecture piece from way long ago. And we, most of us agree is the basic architecture of the net. You've got an end-to-end -end relationship between anybody who's on the net or any service or any node that's on the net. And if you listen to David Eisenberg, uh, and another alumnus of, of, of Bergman who wrote still at AT&T and got fired for writing and has had a really 
nice consulting career talking about it ever since. Um, <laughs> um, and, and, and changing the world. He's doing a great job. So he, he came up with the idea, well, it's got to be stupid in the middle. Well, so Grace says, well, you know, if you do it looking at this geometrically, a hollow sphere is, you know, the nature of a sphere is where any two points can see and see each other across. And so I thought it was a pretty cool thing. And it is in almost a literal way a world of ends. And so David Weinberger and I um, wrote a piece called World of Ends in 2003, the point of which is to make this clear. I'm not sure it did enough, or I wouldn't be here trying to make the case again. Um, but the net isn't only a world of ends. I just want to, I, I'm going to take this off for a second. This is a really cool thing. Um, really cool program that my kid actually found on the computer. I didn't even know it was still here. Um, it's this thing here because it's too big right now. But um, it's, uh, it's called 3D Weather Globe. And the cool thing about it is you can actually adjust it to make it transparent. And you can see, you can see the, you know, see through it to the other side and stuff. And it kind of brings in whatever the cloud cover is right now. But the interesting thing about it, when I, when I was looking at it and talking to my kid about it, um, let's see, i get back into where I was, is that the world that we know, the world we're, we're on right now, in many ways is the same. You know, the, the inside of this globe is stupid, right? You get down below the part that you can actually own, which is just a, a very, very thin crust, and you're dealing with just something that produces gravity. It's a great big mass in the middle. It's essentially... Productively speaking, it's hollow. But the net, in a way, is our improvement on it. it. The way Craig puts it is, we've invented a second world that we've only begun to terraform. We've created a whole new world to our specifications that overcomes some of the difficulties we have with distance in, in, the, uh, in the physical one. So Mark Andreessen, when I interviewed him, when I started with Linux Journal, I started actually in 1996, but in, uh, in 1998, um, Netscape open source Mozilla and I had a long interview with Mark it's the first time I met him and he dropped this line which has stuck with me ever since which is technology trends start with technologists they don't start with marketing people they don't start with CEOs they start with technologists they start with individual technologists scratching their own itch doing something like that and so I wondered what were technologists up to when they started this world um, and these are some of them um, uh, you know a lot of their names, Spencer, uh, Paul Barrett, and others. And and I think what they were doing was, and I actually have that, it's not, it's not on here, but yeah, there it is. Um, I think they were built it to support civilization. I don't think it was all just the profit motive. I think there was an idea behind here that together was about supporting what we call civilization. And civilization doesn't all move at the same speed. I love this 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 uh, graphic, which I got from the Long, uh, the Long Now organization, uh, 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 Stuart Brand um, has used it a, a few times. and it, it not only illustrates how the various layers of civilization move at different speeds, but also kind of the dependencies involved. That, you know, culture sits on nature, and governance sits on culture, and infrastructure sits on governance, and you've got fashion and commerce going on at the top at, at, at the highest speed. And that's actually sort of the surface of the business earth where we pay attention to things. That's sort of the weather that's going on. And I think the Nets founders weren't coming from up there. They weren't coming from fashion and commerce. They were coming from down here. They were building infrastructure. And infrastructure is, is right at the middle of these huge conflicts that we're having. Um, it's because from above, you know, certain old commercial interests want to govern it, and from below, the technologists wanted to govern itself and for nature and culture to drive and support it. This is what... This is what Larry Lessig has been yelling at these guys for a long time. Get involved, get interested in politics, because the guys up here are going to try and kill what you're trying to make down here. So I think infrastructure is, in fact, the next geology, and, and here's how. Um, it supports what relies on it. It has no secrets. Um, it's free. Um, it occurs in human nature, which is the nature that I'm, that's busy building the net. And these are three, this is a principle we call NDA. Um, uh, we wrote about it in World Events, and it's my observation, basically, on uh, after working at Linux Journal for a while, on what the value system was in its simplest form behind open source and free software, which is nobody owns it, everybody can use it, and anybody can improve it. And this last thing is really where human nature differs from the periodic table and geology and, and, and the physical world. And, of course, technically speaking, this, a lot of it is actually owned, and not everybody can always use it. But this principle here has everything to do with why open source is kicking ass. Um, 
in the world. So the anti-net forces don't understand infrastructure, and they have it. That's uh, Edward Whitaker of, of at and The only picture I could find of him was really appropriate, too. Um, and, uh, and Jack Valenti of, uh, um, of formerly the MPAA. Um, you know, they don't know where it comes, you know, know or care where the net came from or what it means to civilization. They only understand content and distribution. They don't understand for the infrastructure that forms and changes faster than business and fashion. That's a line actually I got from Rob Blazer of Real Networks when I showed him this. Uh, I actually, I showed an earlier version of this to Tim O'Reilly who said you have to show this to Rob Blazer. And Rob made the point, he said, yeah, that's what happened. What happened was that these guys were used to this stuff tra changing slowly Along came the net, and along came open source and free software and lots of autonomy by individuals that kind of yanked the rug out from under these guys. They didn't know what to do with it, because suddenly, like, nature changed faster than they expected. So they feel threatened by it naturally. They want to uncontrol what's inherently uncontrollable. And, of course, they naturally want to build what's, you know, what's naturally free. In the meantime, the techies want business infrastructure to support business. So... Um, it's just a collection of shots of, of techies. These are, I, I don't how many people are familiar with Jabber? A few of you, the more technical among you. Jabber is kind of open source instant messaging. This was the Jabber team about four years ago. The average age was 18. Okay, the old man here was Jeremy Miller, who came, came up with Jabber and the, and the name, and I think he was 22 at the time and already had like three kids. They're, you know, they call meetings and, you know, have to get permission of this guy's mom for the <laughs> Yeah, these are, I mean, I think one of these guys is like 13 or 14. Um, you know, really get modest guys. But, you know, what they wanted to do was invent something that would support everybody and not just themselves. Like, wait a minute, our choice of silos isn't working for us here. AOL versus MSN versus Yahoo versus whatever is failing. Let's get something here that actually works for everybody. And uh, so... I think infrastructure supports markets. We talk about markets all the time, and markets happen up here. And there's this issue of opposing perspectives. So while the commercial interests often don't see the free and open sources of infrastructure, the free software and open source techies who are down here and that I deal with a lot often don't see the creative nature and accomplishments of commercial interests because an awful lot of creativity actually happens up here. Um, so there's a perspective on this that I got from Craig Burton and... Uh, as well, Jamie uh, Lewis, who now owns the Burton Group, which is David for Craig. Um, Craig observed that in the open source world, we often make this distinction he thinks is false between open and proprietary. He thinks of actually collapsed distinctions here that the opposite of open is closed, the opposite of private, uh, proprietary is public domain, and that if we actually want something that, have, that works up here, that where you've got open and public domain as, as infrastructure, we want to be able to freely create and use infrastructure. So it is a, I can unpack this a little bit more, but there's, a, there's an awful lot of stuff that gets started here and ends up over here, and that's actually a strategic way to approach uh, creating infrastructure. So an interesting question is how these fit together. So we've got two different kind of models. There's, there's the civilization model that I just talked about and, and, um, and the, the burden model here. And I think if you rock this one forward on its nose, both of them have infrastructure in it you get something that looks like this, where you've got infrastructure down here, and you have commerce up here, open and public domain down here, proprietary and closed up here, and here's how it ought to work. You have infrastructure supporting commerce from below, and you have commerce contributing to infrastructure from above. That's sort of a natural way. Tim O'Reilly calls it forming humus. So we have, you know, we invent the spreadsheet, we try to make money with the spreadsheet, and now the spreadsheet's kind of a generic thing, and WikiCalc is forming over here, and home networking, thoughts doing cool stuff, with taking thoughts about that to whole new dimensions. But, but there's a natural relationship that ought to be happening here that really is symbiotic and good for everybody at all levels, and I think we need to understand that a little better. And commoditization, commoditization is this idea, not this idea, but in, in, the, in the software world, especially in the, in the part of it that gets funded, commoditization is like this terrible end state that is devoutly to be feared by any startup. Like, you don't want your idea to get commoditized. Well, in fact, actually, commoditization is a good thing. It's, it's, it's what we, we would not have the entire construction industry without it. You know, commodities are actually, you know, there actually is money in commodities. Um, Don Marty says information doesn't want to be free. Information wants to be 695. 
(laughs) There is some friction in making whatever it is, and there's money to be made wherever there's that friction. So, in any case, commoditization is what you do for your markets, what you do for your customers, for yourself, and for the rest of civilization. And um, on the other hand, this is, I think, how Hollywood and the carriers see it, which is you take your patents and your copyrights and your IP laws, you push them down in infrastructure, and that in turn supports everything that sits on top of it. So commerce governs infrastructure, you get commerce down under here, and the natives can go to hell. (laughs) Of course, the people are producing all this nature down here. And uh, the content corpus, I think, have familiar plans for the next natives, which is, you know, well, you can go do your kind of free open thing over in here while we do the real business out in the rest of here. And if you, if you, I, I've tossed out a few slides here, but if you read a lot of the, you know, even what some legislators are writing to citizens about when, when they're talking about the free, the freedom of the net and so forth, it's like, oh, you can do that over here, but really, you know, we need to support business, and business is not about that, and the net's about business. So, I think the win for everybody is to see the net as a marketplace. Um, you know, technology's made it, the rest of us are generating it every day. We need to finish unleashing our generative powers, and that means going beyond seeing markets as transactions or even conversations. And so, this is where I get to talk about markets. Um, uh, I've thought a lot about markets over the years, and um, we talk about them all the time as if, and this is what gave rise to Clue Train to some degree, because uh, David Weinberger and uh, Chris Locke and I were found ourselves, this is like 1998, on the phone a lot talking about how crazy it was that billions of dollars was going to fund new internet companies doing exactly what people did before. You know, portals, malls, you know, retail establishments that were kind of replicas of what we found in the physical world. And using the same jargon. And, you know, so and you talk about seats and eyeballs and, and the rest of it. Um, so the first thesis of, of the Clutrain Manifesto was markets of conversations. And by that we meant, we've often been asked, what did you mean by that? So I'll tell you. So we we're saying that markets were not just all these other things that we call markets, bulls and bears, invisible hands, forces, battlefields. By the way, the, the metaphor for markets on Wall Street is entirely natural. It's all animals and feelings and impulses <laughs> and the rest of it. Um, all of us use playing fields as, because of the worst of the war thing. Um, we'll talk about markets as demographics, we'll talk about those regions, we'll talk about the China market as if everybody in China wants the same thing. Um, sectors, and of course a synonym for demand, if there's a market for something, is it? it's a synonym for demand. And essentially all of it though is stuff that reduces to transactions, and not much more than that. And, and uh, so, yeah, I'm going to repeat myself there. Yeah. The part of redundancy part. Um, so what we said was that bef- you know, before there were all these other things, markets were these real places where people gathered to do business and make culture. So after Clue Train came out, that was like Clue Train in three minutes or less, after it came out, we got this really helpful feedback from the real marketplace. And here's one of them. This is <coughs> Eric Raymond, um, who's in many ways the father of the open source movement. He certainly did more than anybody else to, to promulgate it. And also from people I don't have pictures of, one is a, a, a priest I know, Father Sean O'Lara, who came... Uh, to Palo Alto by way of, from Ireland by way of Tanzania and, um, and a guy named Pastor Shio Ajiboye of Nigeria who I found myself sitting next to on a plane it was one of the most interesting characters I ever met in my life and um, there's Eric but they all said the same thing which was interesting they all said well yeah markets are conversation that's like really you know good for kind of like a middle class guy from the first world but over where we come from in in, in the less developed world, that's kind of an obvious thing that markets are conversations. Yep, yep. In fact, even with transactions, you kind of discover the price inside of the conversation. So is there more than that? All of them said this, markets are also relationships. You know, so, and of course, um, markets are these three things, right? I mean, I think we can actually take, when we talk about markets, we can talk about, we can kind of isolate it into these three different baskets. And one of the things that Shia Wajaboye told me was, you know, in your B schools and so forth, you kind of like have a pyramid where the largest part of it is transactions and smaller than that is conversations. The tiniest part is relationships, whereas where I come from, relationships are the biggest part and transactions are the smallest part. But in any case, <clears throat> you've got all three, but I think the killer app is actually relationships. It's what people do with people and, and not just the, these other parts of it. So, 
And I think we're just beginning to understand how killer that can be. And the problem is the traditional uh, search, for example, if we just look, look, um, actually there, there's a, I, I skipped some stuff here, it was a, for, for time, but there's a, I think relationships are happening in what I'm calling the live web. And the live web, I think, is very different from the static web. And the static web is what we see so far. It's got the real estate part of it, but it doesn't have the life that's going on on top of the real estate. So um, if we search for sites that are designed and built at addresses, um, basically, you know, there's a, there's a way of doing that, and Google's very good at it. Um, uh, but the, you know, but where, what's happening in the live web where blogging and podcasting and conversation and relationships happen? And does Google, and for that matter, Yahoo, or MSN, or any of the big guys actually search that stuff? It's kind of, it's kind of interesting, because Google actually has blog search. How many people here use Google blog search? Three of you? And how many people use Technorati? A lot more. Okay, Google blog search is Google's Technorati. Okay, and, it's, and, and this is what it looks like. You go there, it looks Google-like. And they make this interesting distinction. So you, can, you can search blogs, or you can search the web. Why is there a difference between blogs and the web? Um, you know, that's kind of a, a big hmm, I would think. So I think the reason that they say that is because this is, in fact, branching off of that. And that's going on right now. The live web is branching off the static web. And it's, the branching is actually one that's happening between space and time. So this is space. You know, you search for something on Google, it's static. And what you're searching for in Google Blog Search is something that's changing over time. So in, in, in the way those are built, what Google does is sends out its bots to search through billions of websites, seeing what changed. That's what they're looking for, what's changed. And what Technorati and Google Blog Search does is just listen to RSS feeds. And then they'll index those things. They only look for what's live or what's happening in time. So well, one does one and one does the other, looking at syndicated feeds and indexing just those. There's an interesting thing. Technorati's goal, and the Google people tell me the same thing, is a, is a time to index of under one minute. And that's what I was kind of exploring by looking for something I wrote about Dan this morning. Just under one minute between actually writing something and seeing it in an, in, in an index. So they're responding to you know, science for life, science of life. So what are the other differences? Um, you know, there's one is this, you know, the static thing, and wanting the traffic there, uh, the information time runs through it. But the main difference is that this is a, the live web is about time and it's about people. Um, and it's people's time. And, you know, people who write blogs and uh, author other journals, I, I think it's just the beginning. Like, the bloggers are kind of the tip of the live bird of what's going to ultimately happen with all the relationships we're going to have on the net um, that they expect to be syndicated. So, on the one hand, the static web is this haystack. And this is, we're going to get technical here. So, this is, a, this is a, essentially a Unix file path. You know, a straw in the, hay, in, in the haystack. Um, because what happened when the web was created, and kind of a virtue of the web, is that it was completely chaotic. There was no directory. You know, when, when Novell created a, a, a LAN, it had a directory service, and all of these kind of advanced features. The web was born without any of that. It was just pure chaos. So we actually need, you know, a vast kludge, frankly, of millions of servers looking at everything to give you something that's like a directory, and that's what Google gives you. Because so, everything to the right of this first slash is just, you know, chaos. But we're used to it. We're used to it. It seems like a normal thing to have that chaos out there. And that's why we need search engines. But the live web is organized chronologically. This is a search for Reboot 8 back when, when that was going on. And uh, Technorati sorts things out across time. And it could give you a little graph of that. And, you know, and here's a virtual URL structure. Blogs, if you look at all the ways the world can be organized, this is an interesting thing about what blogging has done. Um, you can organize things chronologically or categorically or alphabetically or uh, geospatially. There's a, number, there's a limited number of ways that you can organize things. The web was actually organized in none of those ways until blogging came along. Blogging actually has a virtual structure to it. It, has, it says, you know, you've got your blog and there's your month, day, post, and that's a permalink. When you link to that particular post, that's in there. There's an implicit organizational structure to the live web so far that is different than the rest of it. It's not like the static web. It actually has a time aspect to it. It's what people do it now. So it's not a haystack. You know, it's a history of people and time. And I believe Technorati, by the way, has 
you know, archive everything people have done across time in blogging ever since they started. It's just a matter of time before that stuff is searchable in a much more careful and deliberative way than anything you can do on Google today. So what's going on with the live web? Um, I think of it as one great big declaration of independence in the sense of people who are independent. This is what Chris Locke wrote that actually galvanized this getting going on, um, on, on the Clue Trade Manifesto. That we are not seats or eyeballs or end users or consumers. Human beings and a group of seats or grass field. But that's in, that was in 1998 or 9. Um, uh, and it's still taking a long time for us to get our heads around that. It's, anyway, it's the human side of the web. But it's also where the money comes from. And this is where I'm going to start talking about what I call the intention economy and what I'd like to explore with some research here at Berkman. Um, we'll get to that in a minute. So on the live web, the demand side is actually supplying itself. So, you know, it's happening on the static web too, only slower. Um, and it's happening in lots of net supported movements, including open source. But the idea of supplying yourself, this is, this is really what happened with open source. It, guys scratching their own itches, making something that wasn't there before. It's a huge DIY movement. And, but anyway, it's a lot, you know, it's more than just blogging. It's, you know, it's these other things, podcasting, wikis, messaging, tagging. Uh, tagging is a new thing that just came along in like the last year and a half. Tickerati searches tags. Um, you know, meeting. But buying, that's the, that's a part that we haven't really built out yet. So this is a, a cartoon by uh, uh, Hugh McLeod, who has a, he's a gapingboy.com. He's like, he's a fabulous cartoonist and a very funny guy. So we must talk about blogs. So I think the interesting thing about blogging, and this goes, this speaks to relationships, and it speaks to the non-content expanding nature of what we're doing together inside of relationships and inside of business, which is it's provisional. It's not finished or final. When it when I'm writing a blog, I have a very different frame of mind than when I'm writing an article for Linux Journal or I'm writing something that's a, a serious piece of, uh, um, you know, like when I was writing Clue Train or when I was writing a, a, a chapter for an O'Reilly book, for example. Those are There's a voice that you, you use. It's, it's homiletic and you're standing in your pulpit and you're announcing, this is true and this is final and I've studied it and this is my opinion and it's so. But when you're blogging, very often you're doing something else. You're saying, I think this or I just saw that. In many ways, that's what I'm doing here. <clears throat> so industrial publishers create these finished works, which is a good thing, but it's no longer the only thing. These independent publishers, bloggers, are creating these provisional works or works in progress. <coughs> so, and th this is a metaphor I got in a conversation with George Lakoff. Um, George had been down to Santa Barbara and um, and given a speech to to the Democratic elders of the town to give them some hope that that the Democratic Party had they got their vocabulary right would be able to finally um, defeat the uh, Karl Rove at what he does much better than they ever will. But anyway, um, afterwards, we're, we're, George was actually stuck at the airport. We're having lunch, and a friend of his said, said and George said, well, Doc's kind of a big-time blogger, and, 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 uh, and, and uh, that's what George said. And the guy said, well, what's a blogger? And George explained it, and it was good, but it wasn't quite there. And so the guy said, because he's a good liberal and he funds George's think tank, which is called the Rockridge Institute. And he said, well, what you need to do is uh, fight for women's rights and end war. And, uh, and he listed a whole bunch of liberal causes. And, and I said, well, that's really nice, but those are rocks that you push up a hill. And those are nice rocks to push, but that's not what I do when I blog. I actually roll snowballs down a hill. It's much easier. And, and, or I just try to add some snow to some other snow, snowballs that other people are rolling down the hill. So, and I think that's what the best of blogging is like. You, you roll out this idea. Others add to it, and it keeps rolling, and it grows and gets somewhere. And when it does, it's not just yours anymore, you know. So, like, the idea that blogging is rolling a snowball is not my idea. Other people have written about this. It's, it's had a snowball effect of its own. You can't really own it. And open source works this way as well. There's, it's, you know, you know, it's no longer just your idea. So podcasting is this great snowball example. Like, in, in late, uh, I see, 928, 2004, I, I wrote that podcasts currently brought up 24 results on Google at that time. Um, it's just, it was 4 million as of some time. I think actually it's now in July 2005. I think now it's, uh, yeah, it's 90, you know, 95 million. It's probably well over 100 million at this point uh, for podcasting. And it's becoming an industry just out of nowhere. Um, 
you know, almost literally. Well, that's, there's a provisionality, there's a, a partialness to what everybody who has anything to do with podcasting is offering to it. You know, this webcast that becomes a podcast that's going out today, you know, has elements to it that are not final. It's, it's an idea that people are going to take and, and, and run with. So I think there's a new economy that's growing around the live web. And it's the same as the old economy, only it's network. And in this networked economy, power isn't distributed. It's actually re-originated. And it originates with those who converse and who relate. So, and not just, by the way, for those who transact, which is the filter we've always been looking at economy through. So, and I think in the live, the live web economy, we have a value chain being replaced by a value constellation. That, that term, by the way, came from a couple of guys named Norman and Ramirez, are actually both French, and wrote a piece in Harvard Business Review in 1993 called The Rise of the Value Constellation. I think it was something like the Value Constellation. Um, but the interesting thing is I, I think there are only stars here. Um, you know, and that the wide open space around the Value Constellation is, is freedom. It's an environment of, of independence, enterprise, and lots of other good stuff that appeals to both Republicans and the Democrats, um, a loner together, uh, whatever. And I think it'll help divide, drive what I call the intention economy. So, the intention economy is something not many people have talked about. And I, I came up with this idea um, when O'Reilly had a conference this spring, and and it was about the attention economy, with an A. And there were some, a lot of speakers on stage who were talking about the same stuff they were in 1998. We had to get, get eyeballs, and we had to put people in pens, and we had to capture markets as if people were, were wild animals and had to be held in corrals. And, and it was like, wait, what, why am I hearing the same crap that I heard a bunch of years ago? And how do we get that conversation out of the room? Nothing wrong with getting people's attention, but how can we get them out of the room and look at what pe we can do now in a networked economy we didn't have for the entire industrial age? So I thought, okay, well, what is, what is the intention economy? Intention economy would be when you get, when you're not just seats or eyeballs or consumers anymore, you actually have customers who are ready to buy. So how does it work? It's what you get when the customer's mind is made up. You've got, you have attention up to this point. Marketing is working all, all through here. And then you decide, you know, I made a decision. I want to buy a Canon 5D camera. And who am I going to buy it from? What relationships come to play in that? What lenses am I going to get along with that? Who am I going to ask for advice on that? My mind is actually already made up. Now, when the customer's mind is made up, they actually have money. <laughs> They're actually ready to spend something. So, and I think this is virgin territory. And it's virgin in part because it spent so much time and energy on marketing. And I was in that business for like about 20 years, and I know how exhausted it is. And we can't help always looking at how to get people's attention, how to yell at them, and the rest of it. Um, and that's not very efficient either. So the interesting thing is there's actually no marketing in the attention economy. There's just sales. You know, you've got marketing up to here, and you've got sales out from here, and, and we're ready. So it's what, you know, you get when marketing's work is done. So we have when the customer's ready to buy. Um, and it's about, this is the interesting thing, it's about the vendors coming to the customers and not vice versa. What Don Marty, my old editor at Linux Journal, calls the upside down buyer's guide. I'll publish my buyer's guide. Here's the stuff I want. Here are the conditions I have. Here are the relationships I have. Who is going to fulfill? Because I have money that's going to go to that person or to that company. And so we can explore that with what I call Sir's Law Number 14, which is it doesn't matter what car you want, or any other Chevy Cavalier. Um, the, now it's a Chevy Cobalt, but Chevy Cavalier is better now. Here's a Chevy Cavalier. And uh, there may even be one that I, I had at some point. And, and so the, the deal here is, though, so I have, my car sucks. I, I have a, an 85 or 80-something. I never figured out which year it was, Subaru. Mine's actually red, and it's covered with dents. Um, but, um, so I rent cars. Even at home, when I go someplace, I rent a car. And, uh, and so I'm a veteran rent rental car customer. I know way too much about the rental car industry and how much they suck. So... <clears throat> It's, it's interesting because it actually makes an actually controlled study for what I'm calling independent identity because they all have, they all line up at the airport in a row, you know, and they all have the same size kiosks and there's the same kind of weird little caste system to it. You have Hertz and then Avis and then Alamo National and then and then Budget and Thrifty and Dollar and then the, the off airport you've got Ace and Fox and the other guys that, you know, but they're all, they all sell you, they give away the same crummy maps that 
don't cover the whole town, and they all kind of compete. They have a little bit, you know, treating a little bit better on the line, but they're they all have the same lame CRM systems that know two things about you, and it, you know, they're bad. So, so then they all lined up against the same wall, and the worst thing is that on the web they re repeat the same thing. This is actually from United's site. United actually replicates the the rental car experience online. Like, let's say you go to United. <laughs> some, 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 yeah, you go, you go through, you click on United, and you go, you click on cars, and you go to rent a car, and you get a few extra miles for renting from budget or dollar or whatever. And let's say you're, you're with budget, and you've gotten to the end, you find, oh, geez, I'm going to be in Cambridge for a week, but they're going to charge me 200 bucks. I'm going to see what Avis has. And so then you go click on Avis. What does it do? It actually kills the first session completely. It's like you walked away from them at the airport here and went down to them over there and there's no memory of it, it's actually hostile that way. And they, I don't even know why they do it, except it's familiar or I don't know what. But anyway, they actually replicate it. So I, I like to rent from budget for a simple reason. I might get a Ford Focus. And I like the Ford Focus because, or, or, or similar, by the way. That's the other thing. That, the or similar I got this time as a Taurus, by the way. So but, but mostly what they want to rent is a Chevy Cavalier, right? But that's, that's the beat and switch thing that they do. But I like... I like the Ford Focus because it's actually a decent car. You wouldn't necessarily want to buy one because they fall apart a little bit, but they, they, they at least according to consumer reports, but they'll play MP3 CDs. So I can burn podcasts under an MP3 CD and play it in there. In fact, most Fords will do that now, except the Mustang and the Taurus. I don't know why, but identical looking radio, but one says MP3, but the other one doesn't say MP3. We'll play it. Also, it's a fun car to drive. It handles nicely. But the thing is that they're not interested in renting me that, they're interested in renting me that. You know, so the question is, you know, what would it do for the rental car business to know what the customer's intentions are outside of their silos? Well, you know, they spend less energy trying to trap and hold customers, that whole marketing machine. Um, they spend more trying to meet demand and improve service and enlarging the whole marketplace. So, you know, and there's a few things that they would need to know about independent customers, which are when they have lots of relationships that might be good for you, um, most of what they want isn't in the CRM system, and uh, they have more good ideas for you than anybody inside your company, and also for themselves and everybody else. Now, the interesting part here is that the, the CRM system, you all know what a CRM system is? You know, it's kind of customer relationship management, right? Um, every large company that retails anything has a CRM system. The CRM systems are relationship minimization machines, essentially. They, they, it's not a real relationship. You just got a little position in a the database. They know as little as possible about you. It's, a, it's this old industrial notion that they can't break themselves free of. And this is, this is actually the Death Star that I want to blow up. You know? And if we can do that, that would be really good. You know, we can do it with Tor. Who knows? But anyway. And, and if I want to blow it up by showing them their, that they can have real relationships with their actual customers. They, I spoke to the marketing VP for for budget, there's a really nice guy, and I told him about some ideas here, and he said, he said, I can't even imagine, you know, moving away from our CRM system. I can't imagine actually wanting to know what, what a customer would want. And I said, why not? He said, it's just too hard. It's just, and, I, and I said, wait, wait a minute, you rent, you know, twenty, thirty thousand dollar products to rich people. I mean, wouldn't you want to improve on that a little bit? You know, no, no, they're not, not that interested. But somebody's going to break at some point. So that's the that, that's the sort of like that's the little triangle of, of of billiard balls that I'd like to whack from the right angle, and make something happen. So the intention economy has inadequate in infrastructure for for now, and why is that? And I think one reason is that we still think of free market as your choice of silo, and that's that's really what the carriers have been selling. Sometimes we don't want government to interfere with the free market because we have all you need. We you have you have pure choice. You have cable, or you have DSL. There it is. Isn't that a free market? You know, it's a free market. No, it's not. It's a government habitat, and these are zoo animals in the government habitat. Okay, they wouldn't survive in a free marketplace. You know, maybe some of them would, but it, you know, they're not built for it right now. But we tend to think that. We tend to think that, you know, if you have a choice of, of you know, a very narrow choice of completely silent stuff, that's good enough. We still look to big old industries as leaders. I'm, I'm a, a regular on a, a program called the Gilmore Gang, a, a, a podcast, and um, an argument we have there constantly is that, you know, some of the other guys tend to only want to talk about what the big vendors are up to. If we're up to the big vendors, there would be no net. 
there would be no Berkman Center, we wouldn't be in this room, right? It's us, it's the rest of us that have created the, the, the you know, the net environment, and it, it's going to be up to us to make that happen. We, so, but it's easy to look to the big guys. There's nothing wrong with the big guys at all. Not at all. They've done some wonderful stuff, but they're not the, they're not the whole show. So, we need to lead ourselves. And so, so I think we need to do, you know, four things. And, and one is reify the net as a place built by its inhabitants for free speech, free culture, thank you, Larry Lessig, and free enterprise. Um, uh, position the net's infrastructure as what supports commerce and fashion and not something that comes from those things. Um, equip individuals with tools that enable full empowerment and choice in marketplaces. And that's probably the big thing that I'd like to work on here. We don't have those tools yet. Nobody else in the identity conversation, which started, by the way, at a, at a Gilmore gang on December 31st, 2004. John Clippinger, a senior fellow with Berkman, kind of volunteered Berkman as a, as a clubhouse for that, something called the Identity Gang, which now includes hundreds of people, and all the big companies are involved in that conversation. By the way, Microsoft is probably the biggest leader in that right now, and it's because of an individual named Kim Cameron and some of his friends working there that are changing that company from the inside. Um, uh, and helping them uh, enormously. So, um, but we don't have the tools yet. We don't have the, you know, what is, what's the means by which I can announce to the, to the rental car marketplace, hey, I'm going to be in Denver, I want to rent an SUV that plays MP3 CDs. Um, I have these relationships with these, with these companies, and oh, by the way, I'm not even going to tell you who I am yet because I want to stay anonymous up to this point with a hat tip to Mary here, who's caring about <laughs> anonymity. I think anonymity is part of how we work in the marketplace. And, and making that work, have, staying sufficiently anonymous while, and then, <laughs> shop over here too, with, with Tor, another an, 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 an anonymity um, mechanism. We, we need to be able to preserve some degree of anonymity while we go into, tra into relationships and transactions. Uh, there's a very granular way that we need to be able to do this. We haven't even begun to approach and I'd like to approach those things. So, and the personal, tie personal freedom and generativity to relationships and the settings that, that we call markets. I think we need to give full respect to what individuals and related individuals bring. <clears throat> so I think the ends will be the means. Um, you know, the ends and the end, end network. That right now, citizens um, are taking both business and governance into their own hands and building that infrastructure at a local level. This is what Muni Wireless is about. This is what Munich Fiber is about. That's what we're doing in Santa Barbara right now. That's what uh, is a, a, a huge ongoing conversation involving Bob and a whole bunch of other people um, who are trying to think this stuff through. And on one hand, we don't, you know, in any given municipality in, in the U.S., and this is kind of peculiar to the U.S. because we have jiggered the laws in such a way and jiggered the markets in such a way that our choices right now are between two monopolists. Um, how do you, how do you, um, how do you pay due respect to the fact that the incumbents are there? They have some good things to offer. There are benefits to incumbency that aren't just squeezing every possible billable event and at the same time allow um, uh, citizens at a local level to build out the infrastructure that they need. How can they do that? How can they do that in a pro-business sort of pro-citizen activist way? It's not easy, but they're doing it. They're doing it in... in and they, all of them are doing it differently. Every town is doing it in a slightly different way. They're doing it with fiber, they're doing it with wireless, they're doing it with whatever. Um, they're building the first driveways, the first acres, um, you know, and they're not putting toll, tolls on sidewalks, which is another wonderful metaphor I got from Bob. Um, you know, because we wanted to build things out, you know, where everything gets charged for and we wouldn't have a road system at all. <laughs> so the unstated ideal, is, I think, is that the net should be as fast as your hard drive in that respect. So... I mean, the other end should be as functionally as close as your keyboard is to your screen. I think that's what the net wants to be. I think that's that's the end state. You know, not, you know, if I want Dan to be as close, you know, I talk, right now if I, I can have an IM with Dan, but can I just exchange a file with him very easily? No, it's not that easy. But that's the end state that we're all aiming toward. All ends equal distance and a big zero. This is zero in cost as well. You know, as, as one of the guys on that list pointed out, you know, as I asked this question, I thought it was a, a useful question. What is the first cost of the Internet? You know, and, and if you're looking at a value chain, well, there's got to be a first cost. What's the first cost? Well, the only answer I got that was useful in a way was light. <laughs> you're blinking light in one end of a tube and it's coming out the other end. You can't even 
put something on it that says I see electrons. There's not even electrons flowing in here. What? So it's a tube? I said it's a tube, yes. I said it's a tube. Well, it can be a tube. You know. But the end effect is, is not that sense of place. You know, there, there is a sense of place, but the, the sense is not that I'm, I'm shoving something with mass through a conduit of some sort. So this is zero there. And I think that may be it. Is it? No, a little more. There's a little more. Oh, I think, yeah, we need to netify economics as well as law and other fields. And I know Bertman came out of... Uh, out of, out of the law school and we're kind of going uh, uh, university-wide. And economics is it's one of those areas where I have a great deal of interest and very little education. And But I also think that there's more, if we look at where the net is going and what the relationships are that are growing and how individuals and associations of individuals are contributing to the economy in a way that is not reduced to transaction, we have a new field of study of some sort, or maybe something that's been visited already that I don't know about and I need to find out. In any case, I think the computer business is becoming a construction business. I've been saying that in the, I got that from the open source guys who use almost nothing but construction language and talk about what they do. Um, I think it's no accident that we design and architect and build software and, and that we have all these new commodities that are natural building materials with completely human origins and we keep improving. And so I did get this from an economist, uh, uh, Charles Crispin, happens to be a cousin of mine, who's the number two guy at the felicitously named Potato Institute, but it's a big, uh, a big uh, development organization um, worldwide. They're headquartered in Peru. And I was talking to him about what goes on with open source and what goes on on the net and what is it that happens when we invent a wiki calc or we invent something new that everybody uses. He said, well, that's a public good. And, but after we talked about it, I realized the, public, the, no, the notion of public goods need to be enlarged by what's happening in these areas where they're created profligately and they cost zero to deploy. Right? So you can't necessarily make money with them, you make money because of them. Which brings us to what I call the because effect. And the because effect is how we make money because of infrastructure rather than with infrastructure. And that's what we need to figure out. That's, that's the key to helping the municipalities and the rest of us build out the net. We make money because of it being there, not necessarily just with it. Not that we can't make our 695 with it. We can make our 695. There's not going to be a lot more than 695. And that is it. Thank you.